was only a matter of time before Donald Trump's total and complete exoneration tour turned into a campaign against special counsel Robert S. Mueller, the very man who a short time ago Donald Trump believed totally and completely exonerated him. And as Jim Comey, former FBI director, wrote yesterday, Donald Trump has a way of eating the souls of the people who work for him. It looks like the soul on today's menu belongs to White House lawyer Emmett Flood. Flood, we learned today, has slammed Mueller, the former director of the FBI, a former Marine, and the man who stood silent as Flood's boss, President Trump, maligned his integrity for 22 months. Flood's attack on Mueller came in the form of a letter to Attorney General William Barr, sent the day after the redacted Mueller report was publicly released. Flood's letter accused Mueller of playing politics when he concluded that his investigation did not exonerate Trump on obstruction. Flood wrote in part, quote, what prosecutors are supposed to do is complete an investigation and then either ask the grand jury to return an indictment or decline to charge the case. <laughs> As if Mueller wouldn't know that. Flood argued that Mueller's conclusion that the president could not be exonerated went beyond that mandate and said Mueller was making a political statement. Flood writing, quote, the special counsel and his staff failed in their duty to act as prosecutors and only as prosecutors. The White House attack on Mr. Mueller comes as the fireworks continue on Capitol Hill over Attorney General William Barr standing up the House Judiciary Committee today. He canceled, he says, because he doesn't want to answer questions from lawyers. <laughs> kind of funny, he's the AG. Barr's disappearing act comes as he faces new allegations that he lied under oath about his clash with Mueller over the rollout of his report. Here's House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. What is deadly serious about it is the Attorney General of the United States of America was not telling the truth to the Congress of the United States. That's a crime. Nobody is above the law, not the President of the United States and not the Attorney General. Being the Attorney General does not give you uh, a bath to go say whatever you want, and it is the fact because you are the attorney general. Here's the testimony she and other Democrats say was a lie. Reports have emerged recently, uh, General, that members of the special counsel's team are frustrated at some level with the limited information included in your March 24th letter uh, that it does not adequately or accurately necessarily portray the report's findings. Do you know what they're referencing with that? No, I don't. I think I think uh, I suspect that they probably wanted you know more put out. And to pull together the twin developments of the day, the war on Mueller with the clash with Barr, there's this from the New York Times, quote, Barr, who said at a Senate Judiciary Committee hearing on Wednesday that we have to stop using the criminal justice system as a political weapon, now stands accused of doing just that. And that's where we start today with some of our favorite reporters and friends. On set for the hour, NBC and MSNBC national affairs analyst John Heilman, as well as Donnie Deutsch, host of the brand new Saturday Night Politics, debuting this weekend on MSNBC in Washington, where the weather gods have weighed in on today's news cycle. National political reporter for The Washington Post, Robert Costa, former federal prosecutor, Paul Butler, and Heidi Presbella, national political reporter with NBC News. Robert Costa, take me inside this very aggressive posture that White House lawyer Emmett Flood has taken against Robert Mueller. I imagine the two men know each other. I imagine Don McGahn, who is the star witness in the obstruction volume of the Mueller report and Emmett Flood work very closely together. Now Emmett Flood in a, another memo to file making clear today that he does not approve and uh, finds himself very much at odds with the conduct and the conclusion of Robert S. Mueller's investigation. Remember who Emmett Flood is. He was brought into the White House by Don McGahn. Don McGahn believes in asserting executive privilege, even though he cooperated with the Mueller investigation. He and Emmett Flood come out of the same legal school. They believe in protecting executive power. So even with McGahn now on outside the White House, he has an ally, someone who sees the world in the same way, and Emmett Flood in the White House counsel's office, being the point person in negotiating with Congress as they make their requests. 
And Emmett Flood, more than anyone, is drawing the line for President Trump and how this is all going to move forward. And that's what the attorney general, Mr. Barr, was referencing yesterday in his testimony, knowing about how Emmett Flood is proceeding at this moment. Do you think, I mean, Mark Corallo is another Republican, very much in that small circle of conservative um, legal minds. He quit Donald Trump's team over his red line was attacks on Robert S. Mueller, his conduct, his character, and the conduct and character of the investigation. Do you think anyone pauses or stops or think the way, thinks about what Jim Comey wrote about how people that go to work for Donald Trump sell their souls? Do you think Emmett Flood had any pause about attacking Robert Mueller's conduct? And Mark Carolla was also well known for being uncomfortable with the way that Trump Tower meeting was uh, explained by the White House, that famous Air Force One story we have all we all have reported on about how President Trump and others were involved in that statement about Donald Trump Jr. He then left the legal team. Mr. Corallo did. But in terms of the bigger picture question, so many people in President Trump's circle may not actually like President Trump that much personally, but they really believe in executive power. And I encounter that with a lot of conservative lawyers. They're in on this argument, not necessarily to protect the president in the same way someone at a Breitbart News or someone who comes out of the right wing of the GOP would, but they really dislike con Congress asserting its own authority. This wasn't Congress, though, Robert Costa. This was Robert Mueller at the end. Um, not recommending charges against Donald Trump, not recommending tearing up the OLC opinion that says you can't indict a sitting president, not a law, but an opinion, simply refusing to issue a declination letter and saying that we couldn't say that crimes hadn't been committed. Um, you pick up any sense that being at war publicly now with Robert Mueller gives Emmett Flood any discomfort? Uh, not that it gives Mr. Flood any discomfort, but it's very clear when you talk to White House officials that they believe Mr. Mueller went by the book here. And because of that, his quiet across the board, it has enabled the attorney general, Mr. Flood, and others to walk into that void, into the legal and political vacuum, and start to define this story and argue on their terms rather than Mr. Mueller's, who continues to communicate quietly, privately, by letter. Paul Butler, when Robert Mueller speaks, I think a lot of people will be made to look um, petty, political, partisan, and to have done exactly what Jim Comey said they've done, have had fed their souls to service of Donald Trump. And I think Emmett Flood joins a long line of individuals that are in that category. What do you make of this new front of the war? We've had um, the last two days, we know about William Barr's conflict and confrontation with Robert S. Mueller. He wrote two letters to William Barr, someone who's been described as his friend, expressing his discomfort, not with the media spin, as Barr tried to spin it, but with the distorted uh, view, the distorted take of the actual facts of the Mueller report. And now we've got White House counsel Emmett Flood writing another memo to file expressing his disapproval of Mueller's final conclusions on obstruction. Yeah, so with the attorney general, there have been two different approaches to the Mueller report. First, there was the spin, the lie that the report exonerated the president. That's what we saw in that four-page summary. And in that performance, the morning before the redacted report was released. And now, in spinning, Barr's been caught up in his own lies. With Emmett Flood, on the other hand, I think there's something different going on. I think Emmett Flood is actually concerned about a criminal case against the president. Emma mm. Flood's letter talks about the fact that Mueller went out of his way to say that a president can be indicted after he leaves office and that Mueller was specifically preserving evidence in that event. So Mueller says it's a detailed report in part because recollections are fresh and I have access to the documents. So I think what Flood is really concerned about is 2020 or 2024, if President Trump leaves office, keeping him out of jail. So to your point, um, uh, Paul, uh, Preet Bharara says there's a reasonable likelihood Trump will get indicted after he leaves office. This is a quote from Preet. My former office clearly endorses and believes the fact, as Michael Cohen admitted in open court, that he engaged in conduct he pleaded guilty to at the direction of individual one. Individual one is the president. Depending on what the other circumstances are, I believe there's a reasonable likelihood that they would follow through mm -hmm. on that. Is that what you're talking about? Is that what you're getting at, Paul? 
I think prosecutors are going to have a smorgasbord. So, yes, they could go with Preet and uh, a campaign financing violations, or they could go with one of the 10 obstruction of justice allegations in the Mueller report. Heidi, let me jump to Barr's standoff with Congress. Nancy Pelosi, we showed there, uh, mincing no words. Here are now the three known um, complaints that came from Robert Mueller, who, as we said at the top, remained silent for 22 months as Donald Trump maligned him, smeared him, impugned his character and the integrity of all of his investigators. Um, March 25th, Robert Mueller wrote a letter to DOJ. Uh, March 27th, Mueller wrote a letter to Barr. March 28th, Mueller phone call with Barr. I forget which action it was that Barr called him a snit or snitty. I forget if it was the verb or the adjective. Um, how's this shaping up on Capitol Hill that we've now got an attorney general who's abandoned any pretense that he and Robert Mueller were rowing in the same direction on a fact-finding mission around Russian interference in 2016? It's growing emotional, to use a word, Nicole. If you saw Nancy Pelosi today, she looked actually shaken, and she said she had lost sleep watching the attorney general's testimony and thinking about it all day after that. You have members now openly calling for him, Barr, to be impeached um, or to step down. More immediately, what's going to happen is that Jerry Nadler, the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, has given Barr one to two more days to comply with a subpoena that he's issued for the full Mueller report. And then at that point, he faces some decisions here. Are they going to try and sue to enforce that subpoena? Are they going to hold Barr in contempt? They may do both. But if history is a judge, these things take a while to play out. Nicole, if you recall, it took Congress years to get the documents behind the Fast and Furious investigation during the Obama administration. So more immediately, where we should be looking is exactly where you mentioned earlier, which is to Mueller. And the word that I'm hearing is that Mueller may appear voluntarily as early as the 14th of May. And that is when members will have a whole host of questions, including what was the nature of that conversation with Barr, since one of the things he refused to say was uh, that he would even release the notes of his conversation with Mueller during his testimony. And look, Heidi, there, there's a lot of muscle memory uh, in terms of attention between Congress and the Justice Department around a cover-up. I mean, I mean, the cover-up is always where politicians get in trouble. And if you want to stretch that out, and, and, and I do this at the, at the risk of possibly distorting it, you know, if, if the crime was that they didn't find a criminal conspiracy between Trump and the Russians to interfere, it looks like the cover-up, not just around that, but Barr's cover-up of what Mueller did find, which the president celebrated just a few days ago, is, is looking like they're, they're digging themselves a hole. Well, the question now is, and it's clear for Democrats, not so much for Republicans, but whether Barr is now part of the obstruction narrative. Uh, mm. One of the questions for Mueller is how much obstruction by the president may have affected the underlying findings when you consider that, for instance, the star witness, who is Paul Manafort, actually never complied, uh, that the president himself never test sat for sworn testimony. But now, if you watched Barr during his testimony the other day, he really was performing a lot of gymnastics to not say that there was any evidence there of obstruction. And in fact, went so far as to say the president could go ahead and fire Mueller and it wouldn't matter because they just get a new special counsel and that as long as the president has that statutory authority, it can't even be obstruction. And so I think at one point he used, used the words, well, I think the president's lawyers would say, uh, which then opens him up for all of the attacks that he's getting from Democrats, that he it was, in fact, seeking to make a case as the president's personal attorney instead of just laying out what the facts of the report were. It, it is such a contamination of the Justice Department. Now, you'd expect it from an individual like Emmett Flood, who, as Robert Costa said, adheres to this ideology of um, a legal ideology of, of executive privilege, right. of a strong executive. I would think there might be sort of a, a pause at the human level in, in maligning the investigation run <coughs> by Robert Mueller. Robert Mueller was the FBI director at a time when Emmett Flood was working in the Bush White House, but apparently no one has the capacity to pump the brakes in service of Donald Trump. Jim 
come. It goes a long way in explaining yeah. that. But the, but the twin sort of downward spirals that's, that, that are happening in full view of bar and of flood are really stunning today. That they are, and I think, you know, you read the, the flood letter and it's, it's sort of stunning in that respect. I mean, it's not just uh, an attack on Mueller. It's an attack that's filled with kind of purple prose and, and uh, it's, uh, insults and a, and, and, and a kind of invective <clears throat> that is unusual in the context that you're describing. Like, you know, this notion that Bob Mueller, someone who you, what it were, two years ago when he was appointed into this job as special counsel, universally praised, revered, beloved, and, and spoken of in kind of hushed tones by Republicans, including people in, of, of, the, of the stripe of Emmett Flood. Correct. And now you, you see this, this document, which is not, again, just designed to, to argue with him on the, mer on the legal merits. And uh, you, we could spend all day, and people better qualified than me could, could, would point out that the oddness of the argument that he's making, which is he's kind of taking Mueller to task for not uh, sticking to the letter, which is that he should either indict the president or decline to indict the president, even though there's this OLC opinion that that prescribes uh, uh, Mueller for any special counsel from indicting the sitting right. president, right? That that logical defect in the thing is not what's most striking. It's this personal attack. And I would say it's not just the personal, it's the political right. aspect of it. It's so politically maladroit. If anything in the world right now, if you're Bob Mueller, you're watching Barr and now Emmett Flood, although this, this letter's predated somewhat, and thinking if anything is driving his incentive to want to not just give a bare bones testimony when he goes before Congress, but to really uncork his genuine views. Uh, this kind of thing must fuel the fire for Bob Mueller and therefore cannot be good in the long run for Donald Trump. And, and that's what I want to, that's where I want to sort of land here. I mean, Robert Mueller is someone who for 22 months was the target of Donald Trump's attacks. I remember the day that Sean Hannity made a graphic showing him as the head of a mob crime family, family yeah. crime family. Um, Robert Mueller's friends said that he wasn't even talking to them about anything right. about this experience. He said not one word. It's difficult to articulate what a blockbuster it is, sort of as, as someone who worked in the Bush administration when he was the FBI director, um, the first person in the history of the FBI to have that 10-year term extended by then President Obama to serve three more years before Jim Comey took over, that he had three communications with William Barr about his discomfort, not with the media spin, as the Justice Department would have you believe, but with the distortion, suggests that there's something brewing. And I think, I think Democrats have an opportunity not to use Robert Mueller as a political weapon. He will not be used that way, but to use him as an arbiter of truth. Right. And and you, and you read that letter, and again, we've now discussed it a lot over the last couple of days, but it's so clear if you now understand the timeline and you look at the actual language of the letter, not what Barr said yesterday, not the characterizations, but what, he, what Mueller is actually saying there in that letter and that we've seen the two letters that were sent. He's, he is, by, in an uncharacteristic way, and again, you know Mueller better than I do, just banging down the door saying, stop lying about my report and the anger in a controlled way. There's no florid language in that letter, but what it represents is so powerful. And you now hear people who do know Mueller well, who said for the last couple of weeks, well, if he's called to Congress, it will be a disappointment because he's so restrained. He will not, you know, we've seen him testify before Congress before when he was the FBI director. He's going to be, he's going to be, he's not going to not going to say anything colorful. He's going to be boring. That's what they were saying for the last two weeks. Now in the last 24 hours, people are like, look out. Well, he's Bob, only gonna... Bob, Bob Mueller is now not going to not going to be histrionic, but is now going to give up the restraint and speak his mind. And that will be an incredible moment in our history. And he will not be boring if he sticks to the four corners of the Mueller report. I mean, we were able to truth check William Barr with the footnotes in the Mueller report. The, the, the problem isn't that Mueller won't be blockbuster dramatic television. His brand is the truth. Yeah. And the truth is that Donald Trump's conduct was so egregious, Robert Mueller, who may have wanted to issue a declination letter like the one Emmett Flood screams about, whines about, cries about, really, in a pathetic letter for a yeah. lawyer like that, he probably wanted to do just that. He couldn't because Trump's conduct was so egregious. Bill Barr gave the Democrats and Mueller a gift yesterday. And the main gift that Barr gave the Democrats, if you think about what he did as far as basically saying a president is above the law, as far as perjuring himself, the Democrats have struggled. How do we stay on Mueller and obstruction and Russia and collusion, yet make it relevant to voters? 
And what Barr did yesterday, he took it all out of that and basically now it is about the law. Are we a land of law? Are we two systems of law? Are we the law for the president and for the attorney general, for the rich and powerful? And I think that not the 37 percent base, but the other six or seven percent in this country understand that. That's something that relates to them. That's not an obstruction thing. That's we are a nation of laws. And I think that's something you can start to work with voters on. And as far as Mueller, to your point, the fact that Mueller has been restrained so far, and the fact that we've been so critical, or at least I've been critical, you know, and some others, obviously vis-a-vis -vis the DOJ, DOJ, him staying within the DOJ guidelines and not pushing the ball over the goal line, he actually now can do that in a way he couldn't. It is, it is a bit of a moral imperative where he has already established his, not that he established his credibility, but his restraint. And if he wants to step in a way that he previously wouldn't have, I think there's a new permission that wasn't there before. So I think the big news is Barr has given the Dem Dems a gift to take this to a bigger place and Mueller is unleashed. Robert Costa, you reported in the days and weeks leading up to the release of the actual redacted Mueller report that the big concern among people like him flood was the obstruction report. Was it that they knew that the president was found to have not been exonerated and they knew about this mixed verdict? Or was it that they feared it? Or was it that they simply knew what the president had done to try to thwart the investigation? They knew the list of every single witness who had gone into Robert Mueller's uh, investigative room with these prosecutors and, and agents and talking through all of these instances of obstruction. Because if you talk to a witness or you talk to a lawyer for a witness, it was very clear that Robert Mueller was probing obstruction at length. And they knew about this and they, they knew this was, report was going to be an extensive second volume. Uh, they did not know if, if Mueller would choose to prosecute or not and how he would finally conclude legally how to move forward. But the obstruction side is what has always animated the White House more than anything, because those inside believe that there was never going to be enough evidence in their view on the conspiracy front that would be uneasy, it would make the country uneasy perhaps about all these foreign interactions. But they knew the president, especially with his relationship with Don McGahn, would fly into fits of rage and be very unhappy at times. And whether that ever crossed the legal threshold for obstruction, they were unsure inside of the West Wing. Paul Butler, let me ask you to wrap all this up with the developments. I mean, Robert Costa has done great reporting on the concern that the White House, White House lawyers like Emmett Flood had as he just went through around obstruction that that Don McGahn White House counsel had spent at least 30 hours detailing all those efforts at obstructing the investigation. We also have great reporting from Robert's colleagues that Rod Rosenstein had promised the White House in September of 2018 that he would land the plane because he was on the team. Do you think that this letter from Emmett Flood is expressing some sort of um, deal that was broken that 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 if he wasn't going to convict I mean, I mean this, this letter is really puzzling if they have confidence that their client has no exposure because Mueller didn't charge him with anything. Why are they screaming at the top of their lungs? So here's why they're screaming. The Mueller report is out, which even in its redacted form is one of the most damning investigations of a president ever. The Congress is finally exercising its role of checks and balances. The result is that the Trump team is running scared. And the Trump team we now no, includes the Attorney General of the United States, the Deputy Attorney General of the United States, and the White House Counsel. It's not their job, but Trump has found his Roy Cohn. And the thing to remember about Roy Cohn is that he lost his law license ultimately. He was disbarred for lying and cheating. Hello, YouTubers. If you're watching this, it means you've checked out our channel, so thank you. Now do me a favor, subscribe by clicking on that button down there. Click on any of the videos to watch the latest interviews and highlights from MTP Daily and MSNBC. You can get more Beat the Press content every morning in the First Read newsletter. If you're tired of content that you don't know anything about where it came from, you don't have to have that problem with us. NBC News, MSNBC, MTP, and the Meet the Press mindset right here for you on YouTube. Subscribe now.